Kathy and I are going to talk about our photography bucket list today. We want to know what's on yours. Hey everyone, Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. Welcome to Keep Shooting Monday, number 64. Unfortunately, we have not had a ton of people giving back in this season. It must be the wrong time of the year to give back. What do you think, Kathy? Cold and snowy. I guess, at least in this part of the year. So we are going to open up the assignment, the uh, giving back photo assignment to any of your old photos. Uh, anything that you've done in the past, uh, dog photos, people photos, make sure you have permission if they are people. Any of that kind of thing, we're going to open it up to old and new ones. We prefer the new ones, of course, but we'll take the old ones because we want to get a lot of photos in there. So let's see what you have done and how you have given back in the past. Post them over to the forum by April 18th at 5 p.m. Eastern, and we'll probably talk a lot about those. I hope so. We, we might be featuring more than just four. It's probably going to be a lot of them we're going to talk about. We'd also love to hear a story about each Absolutely. of those. I think that would make them more interesting, mm -hmm. and we'll be more likely to talk about the photos. Human interest things are always great. Yep. Speaking of human interest, I think this is the cutest <laughs> video I think I've ever watched in my <laughs> life. This slow mo video which is uh, taking little babies that are like one year old and giving them a lemon and watching them pucker up and just the, the, the looks on their faces are absolutely priceless. I've watched this like thing like four or five times and I'm just laughing the whole time all the way through. I think it's so cute that you like that. It's uh, on Petapixel. Yeah, it's it just so cool. Um, I can't not watch it, and I'll probably watch it again because it's just so funny. So, uh, yeah, that was interesting. Film Riot is an excellent channel if you are at all into filmmaking or video, anything like that. They use DSLRs for the majority of their work. They did an interesting, very, what they call, unscientific mm -hmm. study of uh, two, uh, well, uh, $200 right. 50 yeah. millimeter lens. A thousand dollar Canon L lens and a twenty five thousand dollar Canon Cine lens. Twenty five thousand dollar lens. Twenty five thousand dollar lens. You'd yes. be nervous even to hold it. And it made a huge difference. You Dead. could see a huge difference in the quality, as you see by what we just put up. There was a big difference in that, in the the color tones, the balance, how clean the lens is. So yes. Better lenses do matter. The difference. Yes. So, um, how much do you think it would cost to rent a twenty-five thousand dollars lens? Probably, uh, probably a grand for a week or something. <sighs> yeah. You yeah, gotta be making a lot guess. of money. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, they just when you do a shoot like that, you just turn around and you build a client. I know, but you know, wow. It's a separate. You know, when you're renting gear or anything like that, you're. It's a separate line item right on there, or even buying gear. A lot of times, if there was gear that I needed. I'll tell the client right up ahead of time and say, hey, I don't have that gear. I need to buy it. It's going to be a line item on your, you know, on your invoice to buy it. Yeah. Simple as that. And maybe you only pay for part of it. They pay for part of it, however you figure mm -hmm. it out. But that's, that's part of it. So add-ons. Big lens. Add-ons. Um, new glass. The, uh, Sigma has a new 50 millimeter prime, which is supposed to be outstanding. In quality, they have not told us what the price is going to be. I would think that the price point is going to be around a thousand dollars. As a guess, again, I have no official inside word on that at all. But my guess is it's going to be somewhere around a thousand dollars, maybe eight hundred dollars, something like that, because that's where the majority of the Sigma lenses hit. But this thing is supposed to blow away the Canon L and the um, Nikon, the new Nikon 14G in quality in everything sharpness is so sigma is really getting good mm -hmm. so hopefully sigma somebody from sigma is watching this and they'll send we'd us over a copy them. and we'd love to test it out for them yeah um they say their competition isn't nikon and um canon yeah. they want to compete with zeiss yeah and so whew. 
Exactly. That's some that's some pretty high end expectations. Absolutely. So why not? You said you shot with a fifty millimeter yesterday, and I you did. weren't a big fan of it. Well, I, I usually shoot with my seventy two hundred, so I'm used to all the, the the quality and the the way it manipulates photos and the bokeh mm -hmm. and things like that. And I'm so used to using a zoom lens that I was trying to like manually zoom the fifty. And I kept saying, "Well, that's a prime. No, you can't do that. You got to walk. You got to move." Um, so I, I think it just takes a little bit of practice when you're using a different kind of lens than you're used to and and trying to do things outside of your norm so okay. if I used it again I would probably meet with more success I mean I got some good pictures from it but mm -hmm. I just wasn't as comfortable using it as I was if you're very used to that one type of lens it mm -hmm. can be difficult to switch back and forth yeah and I'm sure it's the same when a, with a prime shooter they're going to be very used to shooting with just that prime right. and using their feet to zoom and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing and going to a, an actual zoom lens they're probably going to forget that the zoom is there that's why it's good to play yeah and try yeah. new things it is and everybody's different whether we are fans of 50s or not and you guys know i'm not a big 50 shooter especially not for headshots don't forget about that <laughs> i still get on that bandwagon and i'm always going to be on that bandwagon so, 10 easy ways to jumpstart your creativity and an interesting post on DIY photography this week. I love this post. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool things. I actually have a video that I talked about a long time, well, maybe it's not a long time ago, I guess it was last year that I did on uh, enhancing your own photography style, and it definitely goes along with this, but... Um, what were your points on this? Kathy? A couple things. Um, I'm a former elementary school teacher, and so it, I love that this comes from children's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And children aren't afraid. They love to um, try new things and be creative. And somewhere along the line, we lose that as adults. We're afraid to put it out there. We're afraid to draw because we feel like we can't. Mm -hmm. Kids don't feel like they can't. And that's one of the things this article talks about is that the kids may come to them with questions about technique or how to use their gear, but they don't come to the instructor with questions about creativity. They mm -hmm. just do it. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things that they talk about is ties into the photography contest, try a contest, try uh, doing something new. Writing a new lens that ties right into me using the 50 yesterday, yep. something different. Yep. You get a different kind of a shot. And one of the big things that Greg and I thought was interesting was writing a photography bucket list, hence Greg's bucket. Modified <laughs> Makeshift bucket. bucket. Kind of makeshift bucket. It and says bucket on it. That means it's a bucket. See? It says bucket. B-U-C-K-E-T. That means it's a bucket. So he pulled this out, and me being a deep thinker, thought about, okay, well, if we're not going to have a bottom on it, um, we could talk about how you can have a bucket list, but you also have to have a plan, or else your ideas are going to fall right through the bucket. That's very true. And one of the things that I did when I was a former scrapbooking consultant is did things like having a, a, a dream album. You could call it a bucket list album. Well, on every page of the album, you have an idea of something that you would like to do, something that's on your bucket list. Now, we're talking about doing things photography oriented. One of the things I would love to do is shoot, uh, shoot, that's something about you, um, <laughs> teach a photography workshop for moms on how to use their DSLR, how to capture their kids the best, the best way. But if I don't have a plan for that, then my bucket doesn't have a bottom. So plan for it. Have a dream album where you can actually put the pictures of yourself doing that thing in your dream album. And what is your bucket list? What are the things on your My list? big one has always been to at least somebody asked me like a year and a half ago in a video, what is your photography dream job where I'd actually be getting paid for it? And that that side of it is definitely different than the get not getting paid for it kind of a side. Oh, yeah. The pro versus non-pro are two definitely different things. But my number one thing is uh, having a, a family and going around, traveling around the world with them and then shooting their whole vacation, a long trip or whatever it is, maybe being their official photographer for the trip. You want to be adopted. that would be really neat. Greg wants to be adopted. Sure, why not? If you really want to put it that way, why not? I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, as far as... Um, just myself, I hope someday I get to go to like Alaska or Iceland or um, I know this sounds really weird, but I'd love to go to um, Chernobyl. I think Ooh. that would be amazing to go to Chernobyl and just photograph 
around the whole city and they have some I think neat have you seen really pictures from there oh, yeah. like the, they're creepy but they're really yeah. interesting but yeah remind me to stay away from you for a while <laughs> <laughs> i would love 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 to go there someday but you know there's tons of places in the world we can go and photograph and things you can do but one of the things on here is uh, go for a walk. Yep. Go out. And one of the things that I did when I was first starting out is I took pictures of my neighbors. Um, I have kids. They have kids. So they'd be out playing and I would take a ton of pictures and then just give them to the families. It was learning mm -hmm. how to shoot to different angles, how to capture motion, all that kind of stuff. And we said that's Trial probably a little bit easier for me than, than mm -hmm. for Greg. <laughs> if he went out shooting all the neighborhood children, they might think he was a little creepy. But, yeah. Just, so you do have to be just careful. A little, yeah. But, you definitely be careful that if you're, if you're a guy, you're probably want to pay attention there and yeah. get permission first yeah. just in case yeah. um, the next thing is listed here is look at the photos and find out why you like them I have talked about that for years mm -hmm. talk about it what is there what's in that image what is it do you like about it what's in the background like? the foreground the lighting one of the photos we're going to talk about later mm -hmm. uh, somebody had a question about so all of those things are pertinent and can definitely help you to learn even just in magazines Pull out mm -hmm. a magazine and look at how the ads, the advertisements are shot. Look mm -hmm. at where the shadows are. Um, is, it, is it backlit? Is there a hair light? And things like that and figure out how to do it. Yep, agreed. Next one was a photo essay. That can be easy. It might not have to be 50, 100, 500 photos. It might only have to be two or three photos. It could be two or three photos from you know a dog rescue or something like that since we're talking about the whole giving back assignment. Any of those little things could turn into a really neat essay, um, it's just project, some, you know, or some kind of a project, and hopefully you're printing them, doing something with them, and being creative with that is them. That's a huge thing. Yes, it I is. I love photo albums. I still do scrapbooks for my kids. Um, the computer has become the shoebox of the previous. Yep, I would agree with that. Generation. I would um, agree. Get your pictures off for more than one reason. If if something happens to your computer and you don't have things backed up, which we talk about all the time. Time, they're gone mm -hmm. it kills me print them put mm -hmm. them somewhere frame them do something mm -hmm. do something shoot something new whether it's a product whether it's a person um, whether it's scenic whether it's landscape any of those things mm -hmm. if you usually shoot like regular landscape like trees and stuff try to go into the city and shoot an urban landscape Good idea. swap it around it could be all kinds of stuff if um, you know, go into a museum or outside of a museum, go for a walk like Kathy said, any of those ideas can really make a big difference and give you something different to do. The group critique thing can be painful. But, it can be. Um, one of the things it says in the article is choose your critiquers wisely. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you put things out online, people are just mean. Instead of being helpful, they can be mean yep, and agree. just nasty. So pick people who you trust, who you like. I've sent things to Greg before. My very first headshot, you remember? The very first well, headshot. I don't remember seeing it. I don't, I, uh, you saw it. I called you. It was a, okay. it was a decent shot. It was well lit, yep. but the person didn't like the way she looked in it and asked okay. me if I could Photoshop her neck and she yep. had a striped shirt on and she asked if I could Photoshop that into a different kind of shirt and you're like, you, do, you just have to reach <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice having did you reach to I did. Okay, good. And she was very happy and has actually referred other people to me and has hired me again, so that's been great. But I, tr I called someone who I trusted mm -hmm. who would tell me the truth, which is important too, because some people say, oh, it's wonderful, yeah. it's great, so don't go to mom, because yeah, mom's going to love it. But it, <laughs> <laughs> who, me? it doesn't sugarcoat. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. One, one point that I had about this, which is about to slip my mind, um... Jeez, it did slip my mind. <laughs> Damn. You can put it on the bottom. No. Are you going to bleep I got to talk about it. I'm trying to remember what it was. We're talking about critiquing. Oh, critiquing your photos. You learn a lot more from your failures than you Absolutely. do from your successes. So don't be afraid to, especially in like the 30 second critique videos that I send out, mm -hmm. to send over a photo or in this kind of a group critique session, show the photos you made the mistakes in. Mm -hmm. And you're going to learn a lot more from those than you ever will from the really great portfolio images that you have. So uh, go back, look at some of your old photos, and you can learn a lot more from those. And I don't see why that they couldn't, um, you know, they talk about here, uh, look at photos and figure out why you like them. Why don't you go back and look Converse. at your own photos and figure out why you don't like them and how you've improved or how you can improve. 
That can be good. Or if you don't know what you did wrong, if you have a mm -hmm. photo that's blurry and you can't figure out why, ask someone who is more experienced than you, share what your settings mm -hmm. were, and it could be something as simple as your depth of field was too shallow and that's why people are blurry. Yep. So you can find things out that way too. Yep. Learn how to adjust your settings without looking at the controls. Uh, Kathy reminded me of a, of a, a technique class. that I've done before in class where I actually had people take a piece of duct tape or something and put it on the back of their screen. And that means you actually have to rely on this thing called the light meter inside of your camera and the buttons. Um, the crazy thing is, is it's actually some cameras you can't adjust certain things, certain, like your ISO, lower end cameras, right. you have to, to be able to look at it in the back, yeah. but just set it high enough and then shoot with the other two and you, you know, it'll work out, but no one... Of what kind of tape you put on the back too, you don't want to probably use duct tape, that's probably going to mess up, you use As long as it's on for a little tape. while. If, if it's not on there for that long, you don't okay. push it on yeah. real tight, it'll be fine. Um, but if you have gaffer's tape, that's going to be the best. That's what you used. Yep. I think I had a roll of gaffer's and tape. And for a while, I kept it on the bottom of my camera, and I would pull it out sometimes and put it and over put the it screen on. just to challenge myself. <laughs> you never told me that. Well, yeah. that's good. So, yeah, there's all kinds of ideas. If you have any other ideas for this list, I think that'd be good. But what we really want to know is what's on your bucket list, and hopefully, as Kathy said, it's not empty. And what are you going to do, and how are you going to do it? How are you going to make that bucket list come to mm -hmm. reality? Get out, make it happen, shoot some photos. It could be as simple as shooting a photo in our assignment every time I do it. Yeah, that could be fun. So next up, gazillion questions. Anthony Hostetler asked, to Photoshop or not to Photoshop? I just don't know anymore. I mean, wow, what a great tool, right? So we capture moments in time. And he goes on to ask, when do you Photoshop and when do you not? Do you edit out a scar? Do you just edit out pimples? How far do you go? I'm not a huge fan of a lot of Photoshop, but there's definitely a time and a place for it. A little bit here and there I think is good. Um, making the, photo, the person's photo a little bit too dreamy looking I don't think is necessarily good. My goal when I Photoshop something is, or even just edit in Lightroom, is always to make it look like I did not touch it at all. That is always my goal, and there, I want to say that it was Versace that was that way too. He, any, when he edits, he always wants to only edit it so that you can't even tell that it was done. He still wants to enhance it, but he doesn't want you to be able to tell that you, you know, made yeah. the eyes a little bit bigger and that you uh, worked on all the, the skin and softened the skin and did all this work. That's not his thing, so I, I agree with that. Ooh, target. Yes, yes, so that we talked about a couple weeks ago. I definitely agree on that point. But and I think, uh, too, that our cameras show so much clarity mm -hmm. nowadays that mm -hmm. sometimes you get more clarity than you want, mm -hmm. and the photo will accentuate a scar or something mm -hmm. that can be minimized in Photoshop, but still there, so you still have your, your natural look, yep. but not so obvious. And I think sometimes, too, um, it's a good idea to keep... Uh, what I'm trying to say is, my, my son, right before his school pictures, in preschool, mm -hmm. was standing on the back of our car, not moving, and fell into the stones in our driveway <laughs> okay. and scratched up the whole side of his face. Yeah. Someone could have edited that out, but I think it's great that I have that memory that this was my kid at that time, <laughs> that he was an active boy, this yeah. is what he did, he had those marks, because that's just the way it is. Yeah. So I like leaving that stuff in sometimes for the, the, for the memories. And if it's a client, the simplest thing to do is ask them. The what do they what do they want done? Exactly. What do they expect? Maybe show them two samples. Maybe take a photo that you've already done. Show one that's very heavily edited and maybe yeah. one that's in the middle and then one that's not edited at all. And say to them, hey, which of these do you want? How, how far do you want me to go? I've heard stories of clients that have gotten upset because someone has edited out a feature that they thought was defective, whether it was mm -hmm. a scar or a slightly lazy eye or something, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. were upset. Like, that's that's my kid or that's me, and if we it's took a, it out. A lot of times with moles and stuff like mm -hmm. that, I won't completely edit them out. Just I'll, I'll just lighten them mm -hmm. just a touch mm -hmm. so that, you know, it, it can be a part of them and, you know, that, that it doesn't bother them that it's there. But it just lightens it just a touch and it's not quite as strong and that can be a little bit more interesting. So, very good question. Thanks for, the, thanks for sending that over. How did you get this white balance? 
So Kathy helped me out on this wedding, and she had this story about her hiding behind a pew or something. You don't remember. It was very painful. <laughs> I totally don't remember this. I, I don't know why. I don't know if it was this photo or another one they, we did that day. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it's just my selective memory. <laughs> you weren't the one crouched behind a pew. <laughs> that, that I don't remember. But anyway... Um, in order to get the white balance like this, and have, basically let me tell you how I created it, and then let me tell you what's going to also impact your type of photos when you're when you're doing something like this. This photo, obviously, we only had the ambient light in the background there. We got a lot of window light coming in, and then the lights that are there, and there's also the pews and different colors, the red carpet. Um, then I just have a softbox, or I want to say this might have been actually a, an umbrella on a stand on an SB800 or an SB900 off to the left side, bouncing onto them. And that was basically it. It's just one light just to fill in their faces just for a main light and then the rest of it is just available light. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything really big and special, no filter, no nothing. So when I edited it in post and actually as uh, Kathy and I were talking about the show today, I showed her and I'll show you again in the normal setting for the ambient light you can tell that it's really off color they're just they're very blue and they look really weird but then in the daylight setting they're too orange you know so i had to go right in the middle there so i chose i think it was 4300 or 4500 as my as my white balance setting got right there in the middle where i thought i needed to be that gave me a nice skin tone that's where uh, calibrating your screen comes in really, really handy because you know that you have a controlled source that you're actually looking at, making sure that it's not going to be an issue there. Yeah, you don't want to have your adjustments and then print it out and find out that it was nothing like what your screen looked like. Yep, I agree. Uh, another thing that does make a difference is their darker skin tones. You always need to take that into account. Um, you know, you, you need to think about that a little bit because sometimes cameras, I actually saw something somewhere and I need to talk about it to find it, where cameras do have a hard time photographing black people sometimes. They can be wrong and they're off and they're difficult and color. the color is wrong a lot. So I'm going to try and find that post and talk about it for next week. Thomas Schmidt asked, I'd be interested to know what AF choice you used. Single point, group, all 60 plus points. I happen to see Thomas, well, let me rephrase that. Thomas saw me <laughs> at the 5K race that I photographed a couple weeks ago in Philadelphia. And I heard someone, when the race started, like, hey, Greg, how you doing? And, you know, somebody kind of yell out of the corner. And, but I was concentrating. I didn't want to, like, stop what I was doing because I had people running by me and, you know, a couple people running into me. Because uh, <laughs> I just, like an idiot, stand in the middle of a race when it starts. But this time I didn't stand right in the middle. I was over to the side a little bit, so the majority of people went around. They're a little hard to uh, miss. Yeah, just a little. So anyway, uh, he happened to see me there. I sent him a photo because he said hi. And so he then asked about what my settings were as far as autofocus and single point and all that stuff. I always use all my focus points on my cameras. I don't see any reason not to. Uh, then there are three settings in the back of your camera. You have the single point autofocus, you have the dynamic, and this is in my higher bodies. It might be a little bit different in yours. Uh, you have the, the uh, dynamic, and then you have the wide area. I very, very rarely, if almost never, use wide area. Some the only time I will use it is when I give the camera to someone else. <laughs> that you don't trust? <laughs> yes, it has no idea. They can typically usually people can uh, frame the picture fine, but they have no idea about how to move the focus point, and I'm not going to explain it to them. So what I'll usually do is just put it on that wide area and let the camera do it itself, and it's it's usually good enough because it's you know it's so that type of photo is usually only one step up from a selfie anyway. So you know so just a quick grab shot, just a grip. Quick uh, grip and grain shot, so um, that usually works fine. Just for clarity's sake, when you say you use all your focus points, does that mean you enable them all so that you have yes. a choice to move them all? Yep, exactly, exactly. So what was I shooting the day of that race? I was shooting the dynamic setting, which is the one in the middle on the back of the, the D-series with the little switch. Um, basically what it does allows me to choose the point, and it, but it also takes into account some of the information around in a wider area and the points around the 
one that I've chosen. So that's why I use that one a lot for sports. Works out very well for me. And then the single point, I use that for portraits all the time. And um, that's my preference. Third one. Was there another part of the question that he asked in there? It was about your galleries and stuff, which you're going to talk about. Later. Oh, yes. So he also asked about the photo galleries and sales, and we'll talk about that in a future show, I promise you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. So a couple of weeks ago, I decided to try out one of the Adorama brand Flashpoint light stands. They were only $50, and that's one of the really cool things about the stand, is it's really inexpensive and has some nice features to boot. Um, so first thing that I like about it is that it is relatively light. It's not a real heavy stand and it does also allow you to take the center post down to the floor for heavier items. If you're putting something bigger and heavier on there. That's usually, or if you're going real high, you'll want to uh, lower that to the floor and obviously you also want to have your legs all the way out. Um, I was actually using this stand during the earlier review of that big, huge, gymongous, what was your word? Ginormous. Ginormous, that was it, so, uh, softbox that I, I did, and um, works fine, works great with that unit, wasn't a problem at all. A couple of the features that I really like about it are this guy right here, having this separate spigot is really nice. Some of my other stands only have uh, quarter 20 or they only have a 3 8 mount on the top and I don't use the 3 8 mount very much especially for my stands I prefer the quarter 20 but I'd much rather have a separate spigot like this and it also gives you the option to put it in on an angle which may just come in handy someday probably not and I guess you could say that it's one more thing that you could lose but just take care of your stuff and it's not a problem. So That's called a spigot? It's called a spigot. Ah, who knew? Uh, in school we called them brass studs, but this one's not brass. <laughs> so I guess you can still call it a stud. I don't know. But yeah. I'm so, not touching that. <laughs> so yeah, really nice stand. Uh, works out real nice. I didn't tighten it. And that's why it just fell on me here. Uh, one other really cool thing about it is in this $49 price range. What were our other prices for air cushioned ones? Up to over $100. Yeah, this thing's air cushioned, which is very nice. Protects your little thinners from getting pinched. Yep, and there you go. You got a little bit of air cushion. If you happen to loosen it at the wrong time, nice, easy, $50 stand, works well. You can pick up a couple of them and it's still going. Obviously you put weight on it, it's gonna uh, take a little bit less time, but still, I'm putting a good amount of pressure on that and it's still taking time to go down. So that's pretty nice to know that your, your lights are not going to come crashing down in a $50 stand. You have a question about this thing. I was going to ask you if it was air cushioned, but you already answered that question. Oh. <laughs> but okay. also, for, for newbies, when I, when I was setting it up for Greg, <laughs> I said now it's very intuitive just to slide up, but for some reason when you first start out, it's counterintuitive. You expect the legs to fold up or something. I don't know, yeah. but just slide it right up, tighten mm -hmm. it up, goes in your bag. I think I did that video. I think I talked about that. I think you did. Uh, a video on how to use a light stand, and uh, so that was one of them. And the other good point that, you, that Greg gave me when I was looking for a bag to carry my stands in is if you shop around for music stand bags, mm -hmm. they tend to be less expensive get that. than photography bags bags so you can save a little bit of money just a different different market would pay a different things so you can save yourself a little bit of money this bag is like $25 it's an on stage stand I just bought a new one padded. myself nicely padded has a divider in it and works a really good perfectly good bag for your light stands you don't spend a ton of money on it 25 bucks I can put like six stands in it five stands in it Works fine, big handles, shoulder bed, shoulder thing. Show the brand, on stage stands. Yeah, on stage stands. I have the exact same one. I'll put a link up to it in the post and on, in, in YouTube so that you can uh, take a look at that. The only tiny, tiny nitpicky drawback that I don't like about this stand is that you have to do two turns in order to loosen the rails. On my other stands, which Grab that stand right there for me, Kathy. On smash, crash. <laughs> on other stands that I have, you can do one half turn or one turn and it's loose. Whereas in this one, they use a fine thread bolt 
and that fine thread bolt or that the, the, the thumb screw here, you have to do two turns at least in order to get it to lock and then unlock again. That's the only tiny little nitpicky thing that I don't like about this one. Uh, I might even try to find new thumb screws and replace them myself in this. He's but a guyver. He has everything with guyvered around here. Everything is all hooked up. That's it. This kind of that's stuff. it. That's my only little nitpicky thing that maybe in their next production run, maybe they change it to a coarse thread bolt instead of a fine thread. I'm sure that they're probably metric bolts in, in, the, in the first place, but they have to have a coarse thread that would make it a lot easier and simpler. But again, it's very nitpicky. Do you think it's nitpicky? Probably. Just a little yeah. extra labor, but for the price of the stand. <laughs> for a $50 stand, if that's the only drawback, I think that's pretty good. So good, inexpensive way to go. And uh, again, you can go to Adorama or on um, Amazon and pick these up. I forget which I bought them from, but it was one or the other. So I think that is it. Greg Cazillo, Cazillo.com. Thanks, guys. Keep shooting. See you.